Thank you very much, Yossi. And we, from bats, we now move actually to humans. Um, and for that, I'd like to invite Professor uh, Moran Self. Moran Self is a professor at the Kellogg's School of uh, Management and the UCLA Department of Neurosurgery. Dr. Self holds a PhD in neuroscience from Caltech. His research uses methods from neuroscience to understand, to understand the underlying mechanisms of our psychology. He works with patients undergoing brain surgery to study behavior, emotion, and decision making. He has published works that address the questions such, such as how is, how is our conscious uh, working, uh, how can we control our emotions, and even the issue of uh, free will. Uh, Dr. Self's work has been featured in numerous media and cultural uh, outlets. The list is impressive, trust me. Uh, prior to his academic career, Dr. Self spent nearly a decade in industry holding managerial and development position, positions at leading computer security firms. Uh, you know, I can go on and on and also tell you that Dr. Self has additional short-lived careers as a furniture designer, a pilot, an inventor, a radio host, and a filmmaker. Addition to Dr. Serves is the Alfred P. Sloan Professor at the American Film Institute, uh, where he teaches an annual screenwriting class on science and film, in films. Actually, when I asked uh, Moran how, do you want him to, uh, how does he want me to present him, he said he is right-handed. Tell them I am right-handed. So, Professor Serf, uh, right-handed, please. like this. Last year I spoke here and I kept moving around, so I'm going to try to stick to this area this year. Um, so I spoke here last year in the same session, Hacking the Brain, and at the time I spoke about um, the things I learned since I worked with Itzik nearly 10 years ago here in Tel Aviv University. I spent the last decade studying the brain, and I spent the last year trying to understand how you can read activity from the brain and interpret thoughts. So this was up to last year. I'm going to show you a little kind of recap of last year, but what I'm going to speak about this year is how to actually implant thoughts. So in the context of password and security, we don't want to just not understand how people think and what's inside, but we want to see two more things. Can we place, incept, direct thoughts into the brain? And can we also create passwords that are so secure that even the person who holds them in their thought doesn't know them? So this is what I'm going to talk to you about in the next 10 minutes. Here's a recap of last year. I spoke about the brain, and I said that the ultimate understanding of the brain comes from looking inside. So if we can somehow go inside human brain and see the little cells, the individual cells that sit inside in this force that look kind of like that, and find one by one what do they do, we can actually read your thoughts and read your content. So imagine that you have this vast forest of electrodes in your brain, and I put a little microphone next to one of them and start listening to it. If this cell codes something that's relevant to, to your character, maybe your emotions, maybe your thoughts, your intentions, I can actually understand something about your desires, about your, your plans. I can actually find these little codes that code your passwords or your choices of security. So if you, if you don't like gory pictures, this is the moment to close your eyes for a second. But what I did up to last year was I actually worked with a team of surgeons who place electrodes in people's brains near those little uh, cells that I mentioned and listen to the activity of those cells. And what we get can be summarized in this coming picture that I'm going to uh, play right now. This is the sound of one Everybody brain cell. This is a woman dream? watching the movies above. And what you hear are the sounds of cells in her brain as she sees them. And you're going to see in a second that when she sees one movie, this cell becomes very active. Welcome to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange, the world's largest and surprisingly one of the... So this was last year's summary. 
This is what we learned up to last year. And the bottom line of last year is we could find cells in your brain that code your thoughts, and we can basically project your thoughts on a screen. We read your mind as you think about things, as long as we found them earlier, and we show on the screen what you think about. And this is old news, because this allows us to do things like that. We can actually have you come to the lab and say, watch all kinds of movies. You see a sequence of movies while we look at your brain, and we use this time a machine called fMRI, something that reads the brain from the outside. Try to see how your brain looks when you see each of those movies. Figure out what in your brain codes for each of those movies. And then we bring you back a day later, a week later, and maybe just watch movies that you didn't see before. You watch those movies and we look at your brain. Try to see what in your brain kind of comes to life when you watch those movies, and we get things like that. You see a movie, and we can actually interpret what you're seeing just by knowing how your brain reads things. So you see this movie and we say, maybe it's a fish, or maybe it's a flower, maybe it's a body of water. You see this one, we say it's definitely a whale. And you basically find the structure in your brain that code of whale or for body of water, and we try to read your thoughts one by one. Now, I did that in a context uh, of understanding people's thoughts for a while. And I actually had a big paper that explained this method and how it could work. And this paper was fantastic among scientists, but had an awful outcome in terms of the media. Because everyone in the media thought that what I did was actually recorded people's dreams. So in fact, when the paper came out, a lot of the uh, news outlets somehow misread my paper. And they all thought that there's a scientist somewhere at Caltech who reads your thoughts and records your dreams. This was not at all what we did. So for about six months, I had to kind of mitigate the damage of some kind of a, a mistake that kind of became viral, saying that there's a scientist somewhere in Los Angeles who is coding your dreams and giving it to the CIA. Now, this was a problem. But what's special about this problem is that in the context of science, there's nothing that raises the imagination. Because a year later, some group in Japan did exactly that. They took people's dreams, and they kept recording their brain activity while they were asleep. And as these people were asleep, they used the same method. They kept looking at their brain while they were sleeping. And now, without knowing what the person is seeing, just by looking at their brain, they actually could find out what the person was dreaming of. So they basically read your brain while you were sleeping, and they tried to figure out what structures are active when you were up, the same way you're sleeping. And then they say, we think this person is dreaming right now about some text. Let's wake him up and ask him. And indeed, every time they asked the person, what were you dreaming of, the person said, I was dreaming of a text. I was reading this book. I was visiting my mom. So the imagination of two years, two thousand, uh, for two, year, two years ago became reality by a group in Japan. So now I can go back to all the news out and say, you were right. I was wrong. You just were ahead of the curve. So this allows us to do things like looking at people's choices. And actually, if we make the choice simple enough, like just choosing left or right, just choosing to go or to stop, we can actually now be pretty good in understanding what you're going to do. So this is not bad. But this is all about reading. You already have your thoughts inside, and we can have read them from your brain. What if we could write? What if there was a moment in your day that you're so weak and so vulnerable that I can actually implant thoughts in your brain and actually put them there? Well, there is such a moment. And this is the moment of sleep. The moment of sleep is a moment where your brain is pretty much relaxed. It's not receptive to inputs. In fact, inputs wake you up. So most of what you do is you kind of listen to yourself and you try to ruminate on the day's thoughts. What if we could implant some things during those moments? So in a study I did with a colleague of mine, Ken Peller at Northwestern, what Ken did basically was he showed people when they were awake a bunch of pictures on a screen, and each picture appears in a location on a screen. So maybe you see this little cat, and the cat appears on the bottom left, and then you see hundreds of those pictures. And each of them, you have to remember what the picture was and where it was on the screen. But it doesn't just end here. Because when you watch those pictures, he also plays a sound. And the sound has to do with this picture. So maybe you see the picture of a cat, and you also hear the sound of a cat mewing. mewing. Or you have, maybe you see like a, a little kind of... A, a kitchen item, and there's a whistle, and you can kind of slowly figure out that all of those sounds indicate something about the picture, and you try to remember what each of the, where each of the items appear, and you also remember the sound. Then you go to sleep. And as you go to sleep, many things happen, but specifically, we wait for the moment where you're dreaming, the moment where you're going to what's called slower sleep, the moment where you actually are the most receptive to things on the outside, and then we just play the sounds of half of the item. So we play only the sound of the uh, mewing uh, cat rather than the sound of the whistling item, and we basically make your memory reactivate while you're asleep. And then when you wake up, we ask you, try to remember all of the 100 pictures that you've seen and put them on the right location on the screen. And it turns out that you're very, very good. Sorry. You're very good in remembering where the locations are of items that we triggered when you were asleep, and you're pretty bad in the other items. So we can actually take something, teach you that when you're awake, which we do to sleep, and then reactivate it during sleep, and make you remember better. Now, this is easy if you remembered when you are awake, and I actually activated it during sleep, but the reality is that we can do a lot more. We can actually make you take actions, believe that they are totally yours, where in reality those actions are something that we triggered when you are asleep. The, the best image I have of that 
is an image that I had when I was a kid. When I was a kid here in Tel Aviv, I used to play computer games in a video game store. And I once went to the video game store, and I played this little game that some of you might know in the audience. You play this little plumber down below, and your job is to get all the way up to save the princess, and there's a big gorilla that throws barrels at you, and your job is to kind of go up and avoid the barrels. I was playing this game for a few seconds in a video game store, when two words showed up on the screen that kind of made me realize that maybe I'm not in control of things. Maybe I'm not fully in control of myself, because the words that showed on the screen were insert coin. As it turns out, I wasn't really playing the game. I was just viewing a demo of the game, but I was moving the character, and somehow it felt to me like I'm totally in control, because whatever I did seemed to align with what the character did. This was the first moment at age six when I realized that maybe what I do is not fully under my control. Now we know it's true. Now we know that we actually go back in time after time and explain our decisions as they happen. Here's an experiment that we did in New York to explain that. We took people in the lab and we told them, we're going to make you have a very simple choice. You're going to come to the lab and you're going to see two pictures with two women. That's pretty easy. And you have to tell us which one you find more attractive, the one on the right or the one on the left. So it's pretty easy. You do it many times. You see two cards. You pick the one on the left. We give you the card, and you have to explain in one sentence why you picked this one. So you get the card, and you say, hmm, I like the, I like the smile of this woman. Perfect. Two new cards. Pick one. You pick the one on the right. What do you like about her? Um, I like her hairstyle. Next, next pair. For about 100 trials, you keep getting two cards of, in pictures of women. You pick one. You hold it in your hand, and you explain why you like this one more. Here's the trick here. The guy who's handing, handing in the cards isn't just a regular guy, he's a magician. And in 10% of the trials, in 10 trials out of 100, he gives you the card he didn't pick. You pick the one on the right, he gives you the one on the left. First of all, people never notice. People never say, hey, sorry, I, I picked the other one, I got this one. But more so, and here's the interesting part, they get the card they didn't pick, they pick this one, they get this one, and then they hold this one in their hand and they explain in one sentence why this is the one they wanted. They go back in time, if you want, in their brain, and they explain to me why the choice that they were given is what they always wanted. Now, if you believe that, that's where the magic happened. Here is the card. You pick the one on the left, you get the one on the right, and you explain to me. The thing is that we can actually implant content in your brain and then wake you up and make you have choices. And we can say that the choices you make are actually influenced by the things we trigger in your sleep. We can actually wake you up and say, now pick one card. Pick one that you like. Maybe you like the cat or you like the, the, the little kind of uh, whistle. And you pick the whistle, and you choose this as your password. But the reality is that I made you choose that. During sleep, I triggered your memories, and I made you think more about one thing than the other. And in the morning, when you make a choice, you think it was your choice. But the reality is that I, during your sleep, made it happen. Now, this is one thing, but here's the ultimate thing. Because the problem with this thing is that you still know your choice. You still wake up in the morning, you choose a password, and it's still your password. But what if I could create a password in your brain that you don't know yourself? A password that sits there, and even under torture, you cannot give because you don't know it. You can use it, but you cannot know it. Here's how it's done. It has to do with this game, Guitar Hero. If you know Guitar Hero, it's a pretty simple game. People get like a guitar, and they have to play this thing. And after a while, kids become really good at that. They can play tunes in in incredibly. So we said, let's try to do something with that. Let's try to use the fact that people are really good in playing Guitar Hero and create passwords that are based on that. And here's how. When people come to the app and play this game, they see kind of little square circles coming from, from above, and they have to uh, type a key, key kind of a, that corresponds to those characters when they land. So they have to press S, and then they have to press J, and then K, and then D, and then L, and for a while they have to press those characters and do it really fast to make sure that they don't really miss a character, and we give them points for two things, speed and accuracy. If you make a mistake, all resets. And if you do it not fast enough, you lose points. So you have to really be good in typing those characters as fast as possible when the circles come down. The reality is that those circles aren't just random. They make a password. They make a sequence of 80 characters that repeat themselves for, for a while. And for about half an hour, you sit there and you do that. And you think that, you're, OK, you just type thing. You don't really know. But what happens is that your brain somehow learned probabilities. It learned that after the J1 comes the K, and after the K comes the L. And you somehow learned that there's a sequence that comes after another. And you actually, your brain somehow in the muscle memory learns something about this thing that you don't know. If I ask you what is the sequence of 80 characters, you have no idea. But somehow in your brain, you know it. Because if we bring back now 10 people, one of them was a person who trained the day before on those characters, and I never trained them. And we have them play the same game. Only one guy is going to do perfectly in accuracy. So one out of 10 people is going to be best, best in doing the, the sequence of characters really well, fast, and with no mistakes. And the nine others are going, to be, are going to be really bad. Here's a password, 80 characters long, that one guy knows and no one else does. Now, this is not really useful. You have to train for about one hour to do uh, uh, 10 minutes of passwords. It's not something useful. But if you think of the nuclear code password in the US, this is something that you might want a president train 
for a while. And we tested all kinds of things. We tested what is the optimal length, what is the optimal uh, training time, what is the optimal uh, time that you're going to remember, how many days after you train you will remember. And actually, there's kind of an optimal state by which we can train you, and you're going to be really good, remember very fast, and you're going to really be unique, meaning I can tell you from anyone else. Here's a password that sits in your brain, and you don't know it yourself. No matter how much I torture you, I can only have you train and do things to show me, but I can never read the password in your brain. Let me end in the following thing. I'm known to kind of have some gimmicks, so you all know about passwords that have to do with all kinds of uh, measures of the body, looking at your veins, looking at your bloodstream, looking at your face. There's all kinds of ways to do passwords. The ultimate thing right now is to take passwords that have to do with not just random 80 characters, but 80 characters that come from your particular DNA. So I not only have you type regular passwords, but I actually know something about you, so I have a unique identifier of the passwords in your body, in your brain, and together. And we know that DNA sequencing becomes really, really fast, and I couldn't find a way to demonstrate that better than just saying, okay, here's a Moore law showing that uh, DNA sequencing becomes faster and better, and we can even get to the point where we create passwords or sorry, codes that are so unique that are based for you, but actually, we can also do something bad with that. We can create viruses that are targeted to you, and I thought that there's a way to demonstrate that by doing the following. Before coming here, I took a picture with Itzik to kind of, you know, commemorate the, the appearance every year. But I didn't just take a picture randomly. I asked a person, a friend of mine, to take the picture, and I held a cup of plastic in my hand, and I told uh, uh, Itik for a second, can you hold this uh, cup? And I held it for a while, and I made sure that at some point, he took a sip from the plastic of the cup of wine and held it in his hand. And I was actually running out of this place and trying to sequence Itik's uh, uh, DNA to demonstrate how we can create a virus that's going to make him sneeze. Just here. Unfortunately, we didn't make it. It was only one hour, so we didn't create that. But by the end of the day, I promise all of you a nice virus that you can all talk to Itzik and kind of press this smell odor on his face and have him sneeze. For now, we just have his uh, fingertips. But that's step one in creating a virus that actually none of you is going to, uh, if I spray it on any of you, nothing's going to happen. If I spray it on Itzik, he's going to start sneezing. So here's a way to tailor a virus to someone very specific. How good is that? I'm going to end by saying that we're getting better now in both reading the brain and writing into it. And we understand more and more about the fact that humans are, in, in a way, a mechanism that collects a lot of thoughts, a lot of desires, a lot of emotions, but aren't fully in control of ourselves. We're not surely the ones in control. We actually learn that we have biases, and we actually learn that we make decisions after the fact. And here's where I'm going to end. Because this seems to a lot of people as a bad moment, a moment where you think, OK, well, we don't know that the brain is so complex that we don't know what, who we are, we don't have free will, let's just travel. But the reality is that in 1610, when Galileo Galilei looked at the moons of Jupiter, and realized that the, that the Earth is not the center of the universe, and had a clash of epiphany where he said, oh my God, the, moon is, the sun is the center, and we're actually circling the sun, he felt that this is a dethronement of human being because suddenly we weren't the center, we weren't the most important thing. And then this allowed us to discover all of the universe and all of the galaxies and discover how great the world is. Now, when we look at the brain and we decide and we understand slowly that we are not the center of the world as well, that our brain is the center, and that we're kind of a, just a puppet in this mechanism of that puppeteer is controlling us, we can look at this as a bad moment, or we can also see this is a great moment because it allows us to discover, discover the most important thing, which is us. Thank you.